For some, life goes on. A health emergency may be reverberating across the world, but in this corner of London, bustle is the order of the day. For others, a dawning realisation that it's time to step back. Grim warnings here and across the world are being heeded in some parts of the UK. That prompted the Prime Minister to reach out. I want to begin by thanking everybody, by thanking you uh, in the media and also thanking everyone for the, the huge efforts that the country is, is making to uh, co comply with the advice that we've been given. The death toll is mounting. The scientists say the worst is still to come. And yet Boris Johnson adopted a strikingly upbeat tone when he forecast a cheerier summer if two goals are met. People need to observe NHS guidelines by cutting back drastically on their contact with others. And testing for the virus needs to be developed and then ramped up, possibly to 250,000 a day. I do think, looking at it all, that we can turn the tide within the next 12 weeks. And I'm absolutely confident that we can send a coronavirus packing in this country, but only if we take the steps, we all take the steps that we have outlined. But alarm that in some areas, noticeably in parts of London, restrictions on contact are not being observed. Some evidence that in some parts of the of the capital, it's, it's very patchy, and some, some areas where people aren't perhaps following it in quite the way uh, that we need them to do. A message the noticeably more sombre scientists were keen to reinforce. Let me be very straightforward. If the numbers are high enough, if a high enough proportion of people choose to and do go in for serious social distancing, and there's a lot of evidence a huge proportion of people are, we don't know yet whether it's enough, that will pull the peak down. If they do not, then that is going to be a problem. This is, this is the national effort bit. A rather different tone noticed by the Prime Minister towards the end of his appearance. I cannot stand here and tell you that we will uh, have, by the end of June, uh, that we will be on the downward slope. Uh, it, it's possible, but I, ca I simply can't say that that's, uh, that's for certain. Of course not. A crisis of this magnitude defines a leader, but it also shines a light into their soul. Boris Johnson is a libertarian whose very being recoils at the idea of an overbearing state. So today, he wanted to thank people for taking action. He'll be hoping that he won't soon have to reprimand others. Many people will be, would have watched the Prime Minister's press conference this afternoon and would have come away slightly confused. And this is the fundamental issue. When you are fighting a pandemic in the way that we are, we need clarity and certainty from government. We need reassurance that government is putting the resources in and preparing our public sector workers who are on the front line, especially our NHS staff. But we also need reassurance that given that this is a global health crisis, coupled now with a global economic crisis, that our government is doing it all it can on the international stage. Boris Johnson has a sort of, um, sort of bonhomie in his approach to things, but people are concerned. People want to do the right thing for their, for their loved ones. They want to do the right thing for their neighbours. And I just, think, I just think people now need certainty and, and complete reassurance that the government has complete resolve to do everything that is necessary. A quieter capital, but still some signs of normality. How long? before all that changes. Nick, well, well, we're all changing the way we are working. Here at Newsnight, we have new rules. No more than two guests in the studio, a reduced technical team, so reduced studio size. And many of our producers are remote working. We may be a bit rough around the edges, and you'll see more guests in outside studios or on Skype lines. And indeed, many of us in all walks of life are making similar moves voluntarily. But is the government's approach to ask, not tell us, to change our behaviour the right one? We did ask for a government minister, but none was available. I'm joined tonight by Gito Harry, communications advisor to Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London, Baroness Chakrabarty, Labour's shadow attorney general, Philippa Whitford, MP, the SNP shadow secretary of state for health and social care, and Lord Price, the former Managing Director of Waitrose and former Conservative Trade Minister. Good evening to you all. Uh, Guido Harry, 
Um, were you surprised that Boris Johnson did not compel people at this stage? No, I find it reassuring. We are seeing a massive recalibration of the state so that the limits of what is acceptable expenditure has just gone through the window. The, the limits of intervention has just been pushed massively beyond what we've ever talked about. And the fact that there's somebody in number 10 who feels hesitant about taking these powers, hesitant and reluctant to order people to change every aspect of their lives has got to be a good thing. If people are having, some would say, the good sense to do it himself. The problem is there are hot spots, aren't there? And particularly, not necessarily in the centre of London, but particularly around the suburbs, where pubs are full, where restaurants are full. But indeed, you have Boris Johnson's own father, Stanley Johnson, saying, well, if I want to go to the pub, I'll go to the pub. If, I mean, what are we just, are we just to let these people carry on doing that? Because eventually that would put a strain on the health service, which is obviously going to be working more than 24-7. Indeed, we are the most mature, or among the most mature, sophisticated democracies in the world. We are, we, we are grown-ups. And like any parent, you don't tell your child to do a certain thing because daddy says so. You try and persuade them. And isn't it better that we have a prime minister who tries to persuade us to come to a certain conclusion ourselves than to order us? Imagine the backlash if a man who's just won an election suddenly starts ordering you in every aspect of your life. It would be terrifying. But these are exceptional times. But I wonder, uh, Shami Chakrabarty, you know, as former director of Liberty, was the fact that Boris Johnson did not compel people, was that music to your ears? Can I just change the narrative? It's not about... Um not compelling people that the, the first thing to do is to be is to be clear is to be transparent um, and to communicate well and that hasn't always happened i'm afraid in the process so far so i'm not going to castigate um boris johnson or anyone else for not rushing to compulsion but i do think that we could have got our communications and our transparency of evidence um, better sooner. But I'm not here as, the, as a representative of the shadow government in one of the biggest crises, if not the biggest crisis um, since the Second World War to, to point score. So what I will say is that messaging from government mm. has not been clear enough. The, evident, the scientific evidence and the comparative approaches from around the world have not been explained well enough. We now do have, it's not been mentioned in your in your program so far, we do now have uh, a piece of emergency legislation that is being brought by Mr Johnson's government to Parliament next week, which is uh, a pretty chilling draconian piece of legislation. Now I have been grateful for discussions with the government and sight of that legislation mm in draft but we will come on to that final, we will come final, on to that shemmy jackabarty because obviously there are issues in that may, about one the, final point if yeah. i may um with the, 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 there's been a lack of clarity of communications that must be improved and secondly if you want people to take your advice or or if necessary accept your commands you better make sure that they've got the means of basic existence whilst they're on right. any kind of curfew or lockdown at home well uh, philip uh, from a point of view of what is happening in scotland again there is no compulsion there's a cancellation uh, of things like you know there's a weddings and so forth there's all sorts of things like that but are you with the general view that people really should be showing their best endeavours themselves rather than compulsion. I think that's where you have to start. You have to give people mm -hmm. the opportunity. And I think we're seeing some incredible things, communities getting organised, uh, creating support networks for elderly people with no family. We are seeing people social distis distancing, working from home. But I think that you know, you have to explain to people why this is so important. And I think the problem is we did have a degree of what sounded like complacency, even mm. the flippancy today of almost like get COVID done in 12 weeks. I mean, that's just not where we are. And I think for young people who are maybe thinking, OK, I'm going to the pub, you know, I might get flu for two weeks. Yes, but you might spread it to someone else who actually dies. Mm -hmm. And that's the responsibility all of us have. So if you're not getting anywhere, I think the next step, which is in the bill, 
before mm-hmm. you have police on the streets, is that you do need to close pubs, close theatres and close events that people are going out to. So, uh, Gito, I mean, funny enough, it was only last week you made a reference in a column to something that Boris Johnson talked about in 2006, you know, Larry the Mayor in, in Jaws. Jaws. Yeah. I mean, explain exactly mm-hmm. how the reference is significant. I think it's significant because in the end, it seems like a no-brainer to ban people from the beaches if there's a great big fish that's chewing them up in the sea. But the mayor in Jaws is trying to balance lives with livelihood. And for a community that relies on tourism, to close the beaches would ruin those people's livelihoods for life. So what it highlights is not that Boris is an idiot who who takes these rash decisions and is reckless with lies, but there is no option here that is pain-free. There is a really painful weighing up of really bad situations. But what do you take, you're a communications person, what do you say to uh, Shami Chakrabarti about the message not being consistent and the adherence to the advice is as you know, patchy. So does the message have to be clearer? I think on A-levels and GCSEs, there's been a a mess on that one Mm. because they announced the schools were closing and exams that affect 5 million people And we don't know who the key workers are. And we don't know how two of my boys will go to university or not, for instance. So that's a... But otherwise, I think that to have daily press conferences Mm -hmm. flanked with experts and reassuring to see experts back, uh, back in fashion um, uh, with this administration mm. has been, you know, the clarity has been there. Well, um, uh, Philippa, just coming back to you on the emergency legislation, because there's only there's an option, a range of powers, you know, that uh, the people could, uh, the police could detain people and the immigration authorities could detain people who they believe may have the virus. Another one, which is a purely medical one for, I imagine, uh, to make sure that there's enough doctors and nurses to do other things, that a single doctor can section somebody. So are these kind of issues, and the fact that it goes on for two years but is reviewed every six months, if necessary, it, do you think that is no, it's not straightforward reviewed every six or draconian? Months, Let me just ask Philip for that in. It's so not Phillip, currently reviewed every no, six months. Phillip, no, but Philip, just, just on the question of whether or not these, uh, these different things, particularly on police detaining people who they believe may have the virus but are acting responsibly and a single doctor can section some, uh, somebody themselves, is that a reasonable thing to do? Well, I think some of the things that are in the bill are, are, are absolutely critical, bringing people back into the workforce, etc. Um, and I think many of the measures I don't think there's any mm. issue about. I think where people are anxious is the issue of being able to section someone Uh, exactly as you touch on and the detention now when we queried this in the briefing we were told you were talking about detaining for testing and Mm. you were talking Mm. about a matter of hours I think it'll only be I mean this is a 350 page bill which we actually saw the final version of uh, published this afternoon it'll be going through those things and certainly you know the Prime Minister's talking about oh we'll have this beaten in in 12 weeks but yet he's taking these powers for two years. Mm-hmm. And there were there was a feeling that it should be a bit more like things like Prevention of Terrorism Act, where you actually have not just a debate, which is what we're going to have in a year, but you actually have an, a vote to say, yes, these have right. to continue. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me correct myself, uh, Shami Chakrabarti. You wanted a review every six months, uh, but I know you're still pushing for that. So to be, so to be clear, um, it is good that this legislation would expire completely after two years. But we are seeking, at the very Mm -hmm. least, a power for Parliament to revoke or renew every six months. And I see no reason at all, and I'm I'm hoping that the government will see the good sense in that. But um, if it's my turn to to speak now, I, I have to say that in addition to all of this, the fundamental weakness in the legislation and the proposals generally so far is that Mr Johnson and his colleagues have yet to assure people that the basic means of existence for every human being will be assured if they have to quarantine or if they lose their jobs or if they socially distance. It's all very well to say people should socially distance, but you cannot remove their social support. And that so far is the gap. Yes, of course, bail out big business, but what about small business and what about people at the edge of our society? Because we are interconnected in life and by this virus. And so the government has to do a lot more in the legislation and in its approach to reassure ordinary people so they don't 
rush out and panic by and but, they don't breach the curfews or the quarantines and work well, when let, they're let, not... let, Thank you very much for that. Let me now bring in Mark Price on that very point about panic buying. After all, you know, you know everything there is to know about the supermarket Waitrose. You're also the former trade minister. Throughout all this, are we going to see these scenes in supermarkets that the shelves are empty and that queues are stretching round the road? Or do you want an intervention on this? Well, I think the supermarkets actually have done a pretty good job, given the unprecedented nature of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, what I would say is uh, the evidence from both Italy and Spain was that in the week when they announced the schools were going to close, they did have their peak rush into the supermarkets. And so if you think about that, that this could well be the busiest week, supermarkets are doing a pretty good job at getting stock in. I think what should reassure people is that uh, I sit on two food boards and I'm pretty clear that the supply of goods, the manufacturing of food goods, is in good shape. There isn't a problem there. There is enough food. We're still importing food from uh, France and Spain and Italy. Uh, people in the food supply chain there have been categorised as key workers. So there is the food. The challenge that the supermarkets are facing at the moment is getting that food into their distribution centres mm -hmm. and then having enough space and enough lorries and drivers to get it to the shops so, so do and you then want... being able to keep it on the shelves. So, so, so you know, obviously all supermarkets do behavioural uh, testing on, their, uh, on the people that come... What would change things? Because right now, I've seen it, people working in supermarkets are having almost to police what's happening in their shop and are facing actually sometimes some pretty awful abuse for it. So if behaviour is not going to change by the people that are making the purchases, how do you change behaviour uh, through uh, maybe not legislation, but certainly through rationing of some sort? Well, the supermarkets, a number of them, have now started to set limits on the items that can be bought, and that's a good thing. It would also be good if the Competition Commission rules allowed supermarkets to talk to each other mm -hmm. so that they were able to have a common approach, and that would certainly help in terms of limiting. I would agree with you that some of the abuse that people in supermarkets have been getting is, is um, just not acceptable at all, and so also we need to think about how that is properly policed. But there is enough food. The point that I want to make is enough food is produced if everybody buys what they need. But as you say, behaviourally, that's really difficult. Um, I think there's been a lot of stocking up of store cupboards, of freezers. Uh, I suspect that many people are getting to a point now where uh, they've done that. And as I say, the evidence from Italy and Spain is that this was the peak week. This yes. was the week when so the schools were closing, or is now so closing, that people bought in mass. But... Um, you know, uh, supermarkets, for example, like Morrison's, are taking on a lot of delivery drivers and so forth. But these delivery drivers, of course, subject to the vagaries of what's happening to their own children. Should people that are making deliveries be designated as key workers? Absolutely. Everybody in the food supply chain, whether they're producing, growing, manufacturing, whether they're delivering or whether they're working in the supermarkets, they should be designated as key workers. We need to make sure that they can stay at work. It would also help if we could relax the rules about the number of hours that drivers could drive. A, so that we can get more lorries from the warehouses into the shops, but also so that the home delivery drivers could also do so, more hours. So there are a number of things that can still be done, uh, reducing assortments in the supermarkets, closing the cafes so that more people can be focused on filling the shelves and serving on the checkouts. All those things will further help the situation. Thank you all very much indeed.